This is Trepwire Week in Review for week ending July 1st, 2022. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Lonnie Hendry, Head of Siri and Advisory Services. This week, investors assess the economic outlook with a round of new data. Consumer confidence fell to a 16-month low, and the outlook was the weakest since 2013. Final GDP numbers were revised lower, but May durable goods orders and pending home sales surprised to the upside. And PCE, the Fed's favorite inflation gauge, will be released Thursday before the holiday weekend. Manus, markets seem to be looking for direction. They certainly are. And I think that the tone has been decidedly negative most of the time. Uh, when we've seen rallies, people are calling the bear market rallies, uh, unsustainable uh, short-term bumps. We saw a lot of analyst research recently calling for uh, the earnings that will begin next month uh, to be dismal, that the average earnings estimates for the S&P 500 are wildly uh, inflated at this point. They have nowhere to go but down. And accordingly, there'll be more pressure on stocks. I think that that's the, the narrative uh, du jour, if you will. We wrote in Trump Wire recently that there's been more narratives in June than there have been scary movie sequels over the last couple of years as we've gone from peak inflation in early June to no end to inflation in sight after CPI to possibly a soft landing and the Fed being forced to abandon aggressive rate hikes because of a slowing economy to now dismal forthcoming earnings. So uh, I, I think the investor community, the trading community, the researchers, they're all over the map, but by and large, sentiment is negative. The tone is negative. And I think that will weigh on the markets going forward, the equity markets, that is, and on investor sentiment, on consumer sentiment, and probably on the way the economy performs. At, at some point during this podcast, we will expand upon that to talk about what we're seeing in the commercial real estate markets, because even though sentiment nationwide, for good reason, has been challenging with higher energy costs, flight cancellations, worries about the economy, war overseas, and everything that goes around, everything we've seen since March, there are so many green shoots in commercial real estate that it's hard to make an extraordinarily bearish case for that part of the economy. And we'll get into the more of that uh, as the podcast unfolds. Yeah, Manis, you, you hit on a couple of bullets that I had a little fodder to, to give. The conference board's consumer confidence index dropped four and a half points uh, to a reading of 98.7 this month, lowest since February of 21. Consumers assessment, current business and labor markets were little changed, but the short-term outlook for income, business, and market conditions were weakest since March of 2013. The conference board quoted as saying weaker growth in the second half of 22, as well as growing risk of recession by year end. Um, the economy GDP numbers were revised. They were announced that economy shrank 1.5, was revised to 1.6, and it looks like the revision was due to consumer spending. So again, you know, you couple consumer spending with a lack of consumer confidence, and you start to see how the economy is going to slow down. We've also seen, and we'll talk a little bit more in some of the stories later about how inventory has started to balloon at some large retailers. So with this lack of consumer spending, um, retailers that had been supply constrained during pan the pandemic have really started to see some challenges on the other side with increasing cost of storage and, you know, increasing uh, inventory at the store level. So a couple of bright spots, though, we, we mentioned the last couple of podcasts, the uh, slowdown in mortgage applications and refinances um, may actually did have a slight uptick in pending home sales. So 0.7% increase in May from April. That's according to National Association of Realtors, uh, likely due to a brief pullback in mortgage rates. So there was a little bit of a blip in mortgage rates where people took advantage of that and uh, you know posted a slight increase in home sales. And then one last thing on the residential market, uh, the Case-Shiller Index uh, increased 20.4% year on year uh, in April after surging you know 20.6% in March. 
most notable price gains were recorded in Tampa, Miami, and Phoenix. So I think it'll be interesting over the next couple of months to see what happens in those markets because they've hit kind of peak pricing. I know we started to see a slowdown in Austin and some other markets where supply is starting to balance out and uh, pricing is leveling off. So uh, a lot of interesting, you know, anecdotal commentary to the, uh, to the, to the markets as well. And as you mentioned, a couple of the analysts were commenting on earnings estimates that are too high. Well, we saw some actual earnings this week that actually uh, looked pretty gloomy. Bed Bath & Beyond was one and uh, Nike was another one. Well, Bed Bath & Beyond, I think, was the big story. And by the way, we're recording a day early. We're recording uh, Wednesday, not Thursday, uh, for those that are, that are wondering. So we're getting an early... Uh, head start on the pod ahead of the big three-day weekend. Um, so we may not see every data point that comes out this week, but the big one on Wednesday was, as Martha said, Bed Bath & Beyond, and um, really kind of uh, overwhelmingly negative top to bottom, right? Disappointing numbers, removal of the CEO, uh, analysts coming out saying more or less, this is dead company walking, you know, this company won't be around in 24 months and so forth. Donut Shorts put out a tweet today noting that bonds from Bed Bath & Beyond that are due in 2025 are trading at 50 cents on the dollar. So this is a negative story, no doubt about it. They have plenty of stores. Many of those stores back CMBS loans in some capacity. They tend not to be the biggest tenant at most places. They tend to be the third or fourth largest in a mall that may have a PetSmart and a Best Buy and stores of that nature. Uh, maybe a Marshalls or a Burlington, but there'll be some pain there either way, right? The bad earnings will either cause a credit event, which we hope does not happen, or it'll force uh, a reckoning with store closings and a resizing of the company. So that was the big one for me that I watched. We haven't seen too many really negative retail stories for the last two years. It's been amazingly resilient compared to what I think most of us thought would happen in April of 2020 and beyond. This is really the first big uh, shock to the system we've seen in retail probably since, uh, I guess, JC JCPenney uh, in June of, of 2020. Yeah, I think we actually did a Bed Bath & Beyond in the spotlights uh, story uh, in the Trepwire a few years ago. Um, it may be time to dust that off and look at the, uh, the impacts of this, uh, you know, in today's current environment. Yeah, the only comment I wanted to make about Nike is that even though they did beat uh, on the top and bottom line was some of the some of the commentary underlying their news was they had inventories that soared to 23% and having challenges still balancing their supply chain. So I think that's going to be a problem that we're going to see with other retailers and uh, companies as they report their earnings. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think it goes part and parcel with what people think will be a very disappointing earnings season coming up. I think Nike will be one of dozens, if not hundreds of companies that show higher costs, higher inventories, supply chain issues, and falling or leveling off sales as a function of the economy slowing, right? It is a superfecta, to use the horse racing term, of uh, bad headwinds coming at you. And I think that that will impact not just retailers, but others as well. Probably anybody not in the energy sector will have one or more of those issues coming at them. We saw this week chip stocks coming under great pressure as well this week. And, and you think, what could be further from retail than chip stocks? Uh, and yet all of them kind of will have to weather kind of a difficult several weeks when it comes to resetting investor expectation. And we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on the first half, but before we do, there were a number of layoffs. We sometimes put this in the office sector when we talk about that, uh, but let's get that out of the way. There were some announcements of layoffs again with a number of companies. Yeah, so I think we've, we've talked about layoffs. This is probably like the third week in a row, and Tesla laid off about 200 workers on its autopilot team. Most of them were hourly workers as it shuttered its California facility. We just talked about Nike StockX, which is a, a shoe online shoe marketplace. They're going to lay off 8% of their workers. 
which equates to about 100 workers. Those impacted are going to get a severance package and health benefits, you know, for an unspecified period. So at least maybe there's a softer landing for them. Texas-based first guarantee mortgage laid off 500 out of their 600 employees, and they actually stopped taking mortgage applications. So that's almost a de facto shutdown. And then it looks like reports of layoffs at Tesla, you know, are, are ominous for the white collar workers nationwide. Uh, big short investor, Michael Burry, predicted on Wednesday, he's been pretty active on Twitter and through some other social channels. He basically argues that blue collar workers are gonna stay in hot demand in a labor market that's remained tight uh, despite looming recession, while office workers could face, you know, job and salary losses. Um, I don't know if you saw those comments, Manis, but what are what are your thoughts on that? I think it's I think it's fairly accurate. I think that the bigger companies, and I think I said this a week or two ago, they're not going to take these compressed margins and weakening earnings laying down, right? They're going to try to right size their real estate footprint. They're going to try to right size the number of employees they have, and it's a sad, you know, outcome uh, for people when when job losses are out there. But I do think that there is a bifurcation right now. Any way you look, it still it still seems to be an extraordinarily tight market when it comes to blue collar jobs, entry level jobs, food service, uh, travel and leisure, and so forth. But on the on the upper uh, end of things. We've, we've seen the headlines now for six or eight weeks, a tapering of hiring at, at tech firms, a resizing in some cases, certainly a pullback uh, of epic proportions in mortgage origination at this point, which kind of touches all banks out there. So I, I think those comments are spot on. And what we can hope for is that those that are calling for a shallow recession and, and I'm, I'm kind of one of them turned out to be right just for the human side of it. Yeah, he actually tweeted a little bit about the uh, supply chain issues as well, uh, describing the phenomenon known as a bullwhip effect, uh, saying it could force retailers to lower their prices and actually cool off inflation and incentivize the Fed to maybe reverse course on its rate hike. So uh, that maybe ties into what you were what you were describing. Well, it was one of the big narratives. I think um, Barron's had it well described last weekend which is, you know, the, the Fed hikes a couple times, right? Stocks sell off, throws the wealth effect completely out of, out of sync, not only for the individual, but for the company, which leads the Fed to not be as aggressive in their rate cuts, also cools off the economy. The Fed could be less hawkish in their, their rate hikes, and that gives us the shallow recovery. Right, it, it's kind of this virtuous cycle of everything going your way that rarely happens in life. That every last thing goes your way, um, but if sixty or seventy percent of that goes our way, and a couple of rate hikes and the combination of a twenty percent haircut on the S and P five hundred uh, cools off this economy a little bit to the point where the Fed goes to two and a half percent, not to three and a half or four percent, that's probably the best you can hope for. So believe it or not, it is going to be July. It's hard to believe, actually. And it seemed appropriate to do a first half review, which we have a number of areas to cover. So Manus, why don't you kick that off? So we are going to do this from a commercial real estate centric point of view. We're not going to talk about GDP or unemployment or anything else. This is really going to be for our core CRE audience and kind of look at the landscape both quantitatively and qualitatively. And then at the end of that, we'll give kind of maybe a summary of why, you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not bullish on commercial real estate, but the reason I'm not overly bearish at this point. So, so we'll take it from the top and um, I'll let Martha and Lonnie chime in periodically. So where have we been? Uh, the, the H1 scorecard, if you will, now that we're just about at June 30th. And, and I have to say, I mean, no matter on, on what measure, it does feel like uh, we're a little bit like punching bags, right? At, at the end of a boxing match that, you know, we're holding on for June 30th for dear life, right? We, right. Q1 was terrible with the Ukraine war, Q2 with inflation and, and other things. And, you know, we can't get out of this uh, first half fast enough. Uh, but here are the numbers in terms of interest rates uh, a year ago, you know, June 30th, 2021, 
the two year was at 25 basis points as of 12 31 2021 to so the end of last year 73 basis points as of two or three days ago 3.08 percent with a peak of 345 about two weeks ago so up uh, almost 300 basis points year over year big impact on people that look to refinance into shorter debt uh, if we looked at the three month or the six month treasury it wouldn't be quite as high as that three percent but you will we would see hundreds of basis points of increase or 150 give or take from last year which impacts lots of floating rate uh loans the 10-year uh, a year ago 145 as of the end of 2021 152 a couple of days ago 320 i think we're a little bit lower than that now but uh and we had a peak of 350 so up about 170 basis points year over year which is uh, a real you know anvil to somebody looking to refinance when you thought you were refinancing at a time where treasuries were 175 right that 10 year was 175. Yeah, it's interesting. I think overarching sentiment is that those uh, rates may, the 10 year may approach 4% in the next year. And I think we're starting to see, you know, this play out. We talk about it from a CRE perspective. Uh, there is additional pain being felt on these refinance opportunities. And there's been a lot of short term debt issued over the last two or three years at historically low rates that are now being um, impacted by this, this type of significant movement. But if you look at it from a historical precedence, um, these rate, you know, the 10 year at, at 320 is not crazy. It's just crazy in the context of, uh, where rates have been over the last, you know, call it five, five or so years. Yeah. I don't think there's, there's anybody under 35 has probably never seen a, a 3% 10 year treasury in their professional career, right? It's been really that long since we've had that kind of number. And, uh, I guess for them, there could be considerable sticker shock. For you guys like you and I, Lonnie and, and Martha, it's reversion to the mean, more of that. We'll talk about CMBS spreads. We picked two deals that were from the same shelf that priced in late December, um, 2021. And recently we like to compare deals of the same shelf because usually the issuers, the originators of those loans are working under the same parameters. They're trying to find loans of like condition like LTV, like debt service coverage ratio, they fit a certain metric for them. So comparing a shelf deal A to a shelf deal B uh, is helpful. It gives a little bit more apples to apples. So here's where we've gone. In the AAA segment, a BMARC deal in December 2021 saw the last cash flow AAA, the 10-year AAA, trade at 73 over swaps. Their last deal to price, which would be May, 2022, 142 over swaps. So almost 70 basis points of widening at the AAA level. When we do that same comparison for the bank shelf, and both of these shelves, by the way, are multi-bank uh, issuers, meaning multiple banks get together and put together deals as a group. In one case, it's Morgan Stanley, Wells, B of A. In another case, it's Deutsche Bank, City, and JP Morgan, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. In the bank case, their 10-year AAA was 69 over swaps in December. In June, their 10-year AAA, 158 over. So almost 90 basis points of widening. So when you talk about the 10-year going from 150 to 320, 170 basis points over, and now you're talking about another 70 basis points of spread widening or 80, depending on how you look at it. You're talking about two and a half points of widening or higher rates at just the triple A level, right? And we'll talk more about the triple B minus in, in a second. So, so that's substantial, right? You just can't look at the uptick in treasury yields for the pain being uh, applied to people trying to refinance. It's the whole package of what the higher yields are on the treasuries plus the delta in risk-free of spread over risk-free debt. Uh, triple Bs back in December, triple Bs were, were going for an average of 365 over the curve between those two deals. Uh, the last two deals done, that BMARC and that bank, were done with an average of about 570 over the curve. So in that part, we're about 200 basis points over 
uh, at the triple B minus level. So between there, again, 170 on the treasury, 200 basis points in spread, you're 320 basis points wider or higher in yield than you were in December. I think on the front end of this podcast, Martha, we should have said, bring your whiteboard, because that was a really great lesson and kind of where we're at, where we're going. I think you could do a very similar analysis for those of us on the CRE side related to like a paired sales analysis, you know, same store sales. So if you look at a property that, tr that traded, you know, a year and a half or two years ago compared to what it is now in the current environment and see what the impacts are. We've done that on the podcast for the last couple of months where it seems like in several markets, properties have been acquired and sold in the last 18 months at a, almost a one and a half multiple or something of what it, it traded for initially. But I think with these spreads with with rates, we're going to start seeing that type of analysis where, you know, upon the second sale, there's a, a leveling off or maybe even a decline. But um, uh, maybe we should put out some cliff notes on this one uh, when we release the pod. I think I'm seeing a video of Manis writing on a whiteboard. You ever see those uh, Khan Academy videos? That's exactly what I'm picturing with a nice calm voice. Manis explains how this how, with all these arrows going everywhere. <laughs> Well, they used to have those UPS commercials with a guy with a long kind of Rick Springfield, like 1980s hair, you know, with the white button down and he'd be up there and all of a sudden a box would turn into a plane and the plane would turn into a, a building and all this other stuff. I, you know, it was an incredible gift that guy had. I wish I had that, that, uh, that kind of gift to make those kind of visuals. I could barely draw stick figures, but yeah, that would be kind of a cool thing if we could find that guy. If you're listening. UPS man, let us know. Maybe we'll uh, engage you to to do a CMBS drawing. I actually uh, attempted to do the Khan Academy in some of my classes. I was like, "Oh, this is awesome!" So I'm going to like become become Sal Khan and like have some whiteboard sessions in my classes. That lasted about 25 <laughs> minutes because I couldn't functionally do it. I I couldn't keep my hand off of the the drawing board. I couldn't. I, it was terrible. Like it, that's that's a skill in itself. So let's get on to CMBX spreads. A couple more data points out there. We'll try to run through these quickly. CMBX 14, that was the old, the most recent CMBX issue that was around for both year end 2021 and currently CMBX 15 didn't come out until a couple months later. It's AAA spread wider by 32 basis points over the last six months. Uh, triple B minus wider by 270 basis points. And that data is courtesy of uh, market who administers CMBX. Lastly, one more data point I'll throw out there, delinquencies. You've heard this before, and we'll do our delinquency report next week during the pod. June 2021, overall delinquency 6.15%. May 2022, 3.14%. So a halving of the delinquency rate, and now we're only at about 30% uh, of what the rate was at its peak uh, COVID period in June 2020. So that's kind of the lay of the land, if you will, so far. And now we're going to roll from that into, you know, I'm, I'm going to make what I would call a semi bullish case for the market, or maybe I should call it a glass half full case for the market. So I'm going to throw these out there and, and give them a chance to react. So let's start with issuance. Right. And, and what I'm going to try to do here is paint a picture of what I think is a performing market. Right. H1 2021, we saw 46 billion in issuance. And this does not include CRE CLOs, which were plentiful in 2021 and in 2022. For H1 2022, 53 billion. So even though the economy, global economic issues, supply chains, everything else have landed several uppercuts on the financial markets. The markets continue to bring new issue to market. And we've seen deals price April, May, June, including several over the last couple of weeks. So the market is, is performing here. And I, and I think that's the big takeaway because we have seen other periods of time in the late 90s, in 2008 to 2010 and in 2016 where the market did seize and there were no there was no issuance whatsoever whatsoever 
we have yet to see this at all, despite the higher interest rates and the widening spreads, right? So, so that's bullet point number one for me. The other thing I want to roll out, and then I'll kind of open it up to Martha and Lonnie to, to take the other side of the coin, is in the last 10 days, we've seen an extraordinary number of deals getting done. And what I mean deals is sales at extraordinarily high prices, right? And this has the tone of not people being risk off, risk averse, pulling back in, keeping their powder dry. This is, it looks like a case of people taking advantage of an opportunity to get something which may be five to 10% cheaper than it was a month ago. And, and let me run through some of these. A portfolio of 14 grocery anchored properties, $425 billion. This is nationwide. Williamsburg, Virginia, um, the Bend, Arbordale apartment complex, $100 million. In Miami, 1221 Brickell Avenue, that went for $285.5 million. And let me give you a comparable on that. This, this was bought by Rockport, by the way. And this particular property went for $155 million in 2017. So an uptick of 84% even now. So would this property have gone for $305 million? Um, a month or two ago, maybe, right? Maybe it's five to 10% lower. And the sellers, you know, maybe not have hit the absolute peak, but, you know, 286 million is putting real money to work. In Morrisville, North Carolina, the Preston View Apartments, this one for $124 million, 57% above the 2020 valuation. In Atlanta, the Atlanta Financial Center, 182 million. Uh, that was a slight discount to where it traded last. In El Segundo, California, 555 Aviation Boulevard, 205.5 million, 156% above 2015 value, right? Granted there, I think there's a lot of redevelopment done. That may not be a great benchmark. This next one will disappoint Lonnie tremendously. Out in Santa Clara, California, they're getting rid of the Great America Amusement Park their Prologis is buying uh, 112 acres there for 310 million. Upper East Side, New York, 1.75 billion for 1,700 market level units apartments. So I don't want to come off as as kind of a permable. It's not my thing. I really try to call it as I see it. But smart people don't put nine figures to work 10 or 15 times in a given week in a market that is edgy. This is a market where people are itching to pull the trigger to get things that they previously couldn't get their hands on. And I think that's a sign of health. Yeah, I would generally agree, uh, man. It's a couple of maybe counterpoints. I think a lot of capital was raised at the onset of the pandemic that people thought they'd be able to place in distressed assets, which they weren't able to because there was no distress to speak of. And so now those funds have to get placed somewhere. And so people are trying to find relative value or, you know, the best risk, risk adjusted returns that they can. And so they're, they're flat, you know, flying to quality. The, the prologist thing was interesting. I think in that instance, uh, to support your thesis, there's still a lease in place, I believe for the amusement park for a few years. So they're actually parking that money without even being able to, to realize any type of redevelopment for, I think about six years from the, the time of sale. Um, which would bode well for your thesis of, you know, the market being healthy and long-term prospects. I think it's interesting too, you know, you kind of have to look at the market in, in two senses. You have the stock market and you have the investment uh, that goes along with that. And then you have the CRE market and, you know, CRE is just a more stable asset class. It's, it's more predictable. It's more tangible. I think in the times of uncertainty that we're facing right now, macro and, and geopolitical, People just have a lot more faith in real estate investments. And I think we're seeing that uh, in practice. So, you know, to support your, your position, there's a couple of other things. Eric Sherman from Globe Street actually had a green shoot right up about New York's uh, office leasing market. So I know we've talked a lot about some of the challenges offices have faced and maybe potential downsizing, right sizing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, his story actually showed that the office leasing market through May of this year was about 6.5 million worth of uh, 
square footage signed new leases in New York City, which is 5.9% above the five-year average between 2015 and 2019. So even with all the work from home, even with all the downsizing, right-sizing, whatever you want to call it, activity was, was up. Uh, it's interesting. I didn't see where he had talked about rates. So, you know, I'm not sure what the, the rates are on those new leases comparative to the previous leases, but it, it, it's still good news. On the flip side of that, though, IBM CEO was interviewed on CNBC this week, and he said for their U.S.-based workers, only about 20% of their uh, workers were in the office three days a week or more, and basically acknowledged he doesn't see a, an instance where that workforce comes back to pre-pandemic levels, which were around 60% in the office more than three days a week. Good and bad on the office market. I think the hotel sector uh, has been really productive over the last, call it 12, 18 months. And CEO Best Western actually uh, talked today about occupancy, ADR, RevPAR, exceeding pre-pandemic levels in many markets. You know, he, he highlighted some markets in particular, Portland, Seattle, New York, San Francisco, where he said occupancies were above 75% for the week ending in June 18, which is higher than historical norms. I think in most major markets, if you can have stabilized hotel occupancy between 65 and 70%, most operators are very well pleased with that. So above 75 is, is a high watermark. And then... You know, retail, we've seen a lot of these larger mall loans getting extended. Um, so some of the distress that we thought maybe was coming there has been pushed off. Uh, apartments still being sold, 50% premiums. Um, we actually saw an article in Wall Street Journal this week that talked about uh, the tenant side having bidding wars. So we, we've read and seen and talked about on um, single family rentals or you know, residential properties, excuse me, residential properties for sale, people bidding above asking price and driving up, you know, through bidding wars. Now we're starting to see that on the rental side. So it'll be interesting to see. That'll be something to keep an eye on over the next couple of months. Did and you last see, thing, just to comment on that, in that story, people are resorting to writing pick me letters and getting letters of recommendations from their landlords. You know, what's interesting about kind of that? Yeah. So that creates problems actually, because uh, there are fair housing implications tied to that. So the selection of tenants has to be done in an equitable manner based on set criteria that's objective. And when people start writing personal letters or you start appealing to, you know, something, you know, somebody with a cute dog picture and, and three really good recommendation letters from their previous landlords, that creates some other issues. So if you're a property owner and you're renting property, you need to make sure you're adhering to the uh, fair housing standards because if you have one of those complaints, it's a uh, fairly arduous task and there can be some pretty hefty penalties involved with that. So better just to stick to the script and follow the uh, the underwriting criteria that you have set for tenant selection. Last Great thing here. advice from a guy <laughs> who maybe has never gotten a good recommendation before. <laughs> maybe from uh, his mom. <laughs> yeah, my mom will give me a good recommendation, at least I think. Um, industrial, though, Manis, this is kind of like office. I think it's we're starting to see both sides of the coin here. So great news, Prologis Duke, you know, announced their uh, the acquisition, uh, Prologis acquiring Duke. That's probably a bullish case for the market. Prologis knows what they're doing in industrial. They're a market mover. Um the Amazon comments, though, about being over warehoused, you know, that's probably something that maybe is a little glass half half full. Um, and then something kind of as a, as a nugget this week that came out was uh, Jim Chanos announced she's raising a $200 million fund that's basically going to short the uh, U.S. listed data center REITs. And so some interesting discussion could be had around that. I mean, those REITs have been seen as very solid because they have a very captive tenant, usually with very high build out, long-term leases in place, et cetera. But I think we've actually talked on the pod before about how those tenants are technology companies in most cases. And at some point, they're going to probably just build their own version of that. And I think we're starting to see maybe the, the scales tilt a little bit to that, that side, or at least that's Chanos' thesis. Yeah. If you've ever, you guys ever been in a data center, it is kind of cool, actually. This was an old fashioned D1 back in the day when there were mainframes. I know that makes me sound ancient, 
but it was cool. The elevator went down. You were in a room that was basically dark, air conditioned, concrete. A tornado could come, and that place would never have been impacted. But it sounds like, from what Chanos is saying, the uh, the tech titans want kind of a different look for their server farms and cloud. Yeah, I mean, we may have seen peak demand at this point, you know, or, or both maybe peak demand and the start of oversupply uh, at the same time, right? I would say we have three negative tells and one positive tell for that market, right? The positive tell, Lonnie just talked about the big merger uh, that we saw a couple of weeks ago, 25 billion or 26 billion, whatever that was. The three negative tells, Amazon, you can't discount that, the fact that they feel over warehoused. Uh, Chanos is a very smart guy, if I'm not mistaken, he's a big Ranger fan too, which makes him doubly smart and triply likable. You know, uh, he's a smart guy and, and, and he kind of reads the tea leaves to be that Amazon and others will want their own uh, properties that they build themselves. Interesting thesis. And then we saw KKR uh, get into this market to start building these. And anytime you see somebody who I, I call it a tourist joining a market that they've never had uh, really a footprint in, uh, I start to wonder if we start to see a, a peak in, in that particular type of uh, asset. We are about to publish our bank loan performance data called Taller, and we'll give you a quick appetizer of what that looks like. You can actually uh, download the full report uh, from our webpage. Yeah, and for those that don't know, Taller is an acronym that stands for TREPS Anonymized Loan Level Repository. It's a consortium of banks that uh, give us their information, and then we uh, we analyze it and then uh, make it available. And so uh, for Q1 or 22, there was an uptick in delinquency rates across loan performance at banks, erosion in office, higher interest rates, and slower originations. So not too, too different from the CMBS marketplace. Uh, overall CRE delinquency from our bank data rate increased slightly with the office sector as a main contributor to the increase. Increase was primarily driven by short-term delinquencies with the overall rate raising from 2.89% from 0.87% in the fourth quarter. You know, even though it's a modest or slight uptick, it is noticeable uh, because with the last couple of quarters, we've seen improvement in the delinquency uh, rating. Uh, serious delinquency rate, uh, non-current loan rate uh, continue to improve, falling by four basis points to 0.65%. Uh, concerns about the office property type have continued to increase with bank uh, risk ratings on office loans in large urban markets uh, going up. And then higher interest rates have started to uh, take a bite. Origination volume fell in Q1, although industrial multifamily remain relative bright spots. So again, some parallels to our uh, securitized CMBS data that we track as well. Highest delinquency rates were in lodging and retail, although the delinquency rate for retail has been improving since fourth quarter of 2020. Um, and lodging has uh, declined since Q4 21. It's two sectors were the hardest hit by COVID, but even them, uh, we're starting to see some improvement um, over the last couple of quarters. So, you know, nothing earth shattering here, but it does kind of uh, confirm what we've talked about on the podcast and what we're seeing with some of our other data as well. So we have a number of other stories, but I know we probably won't get through all of them. So we're going to be particularly selective. We'll start with uh, office. Judicious. Is that the word we're going to go with? Good we're one. Judicious yes. in, our, Discerning. in our time. Well, people have three days to listen to the podcast. I thought maybe we'd hit them with like an hour and 45 minutes oh. today. Is that... Uh, Ooh, Haley is looking at us like, <laughs> please don't. Particularly abusive. Yeah, bit. we'll go through a couple of things real, real quickly. We have both crabgrass and green shoots in, in the office space. I would start out on the office space before getting into the specifics by saying this, that we're now 27 or 28 months into COVID, into the new lifestyle, into people not going into the office. If you uh, think about the average office lease at, at 10 years, you know, we are now closing in on 25% of time for all of these leases to roll, right? And if they're equally distributed, we're talking about one out of every four leases will have rolled since the beginning of COVID, right? And thus far, even though we've seen 
considerable stories about downsizing, it hasn't become kind of the epic disaster that some people have said it would. Could it turn out that way? Sure, right? Could that happen? Could we see this gain momentum over the next five or 10 years? Sure, but I, I think the fact that we're now almost two and a half years into COVID, the fact that this hasn't become an epidemic uh, is a positive sign. And, and, you know, just uh, one more green shoot. Uh, looking at, at the negative stories first, Peloton is looking to sublet 100,000 square feet near Penn Station. Uh, everybody knows about Peloton's plentiful and colorful downturn over the last year, stock down 80%, sales off, new leadership and so forth. Now they're looking to uh, get rid of 100,000 square feet in Midtown West. They have 300,000 square feet total there. Uh, another tenant in that building is Lyft, which has a lease that expires in 2025. So two unicorns that could be heavy on cash burn make up 75% of that tenant base. Certainly an asset to watch uh, over time. In Washington, New York, and Chicago, Yelp is closing offices. Uh, this is a really scary one, closing down 450,000 square feet in total because uh, while they offered return to work option for their employees, only 1% hit the bid. Only 1% of office workers came back at Yelp. And so they're cleaning out of offices in those three cities. Uh, Bridgestone is vacating 100,000 square feet in downtown Nashville. We rarely hear of anything bad in Nashville. It's a very strong market there. Bridgestone giving up a big chunk of space. Chevron downsizing in the Bay Area, also moving a bunch of employees from San Ramon in California to Houston. This one's kind of greenish. Wells Fargo Bank has recommitted to more than 600,000 square feet of office space in San Francisco. Um, this is at 333 Market Street. That's a great story. Columbia Property Trust owns that building. Wells Fargo, I think, committed for another 10 years, which is terrific. Why is this greenish and not, you know, kind of a, a firecracker event? Uh, because Wells Fargo will be selling one of their existing assets where they have space and they will be uh, leaving another building in San Francisco. But anytime you get a renewal of 600,000 square feet, uh, that's a big story. So I've given you crabgrass. I've given you one greenish. I do have, God, five, six, seven really nice stories, you know, in the green category. The one really nice one I saw recently was that uh, Lathrop in Minneapolis, uh, renewed downtown Minneapolis has seen a lot of uh, departures, Target being the biggest one. The fact that they are renewing for another 10 years big in, in that particular city and the, the office that they are renewing at does back a big CMBS loan. And there was a story today uh, also that Microsoft is looking for more space in the Chicago story. So those are our, some of our green shoots uh, for this week, but I could have gone on and on. I had another half dozen. You know, it was a good week for transactions and lease renewals. Yeah, so to continue the trend on the uh, the green shoots, we had a couple of hotel stories we we're going to highlight. Uh, Pebble Brook Hotel Trust acquired Gurney's Newport Resort and Marina, 10-acre waterside resort uh, located in Rhode Island for $174 million. A uh, 270-room hotel is located on Goat Island in Newport. Features unobstructed views of Newport Harbor and Newport Bridge. So really nice price for, uh, for that resort. There was another um, hotel in Nashville, Broad West Hotel, sold for $170 million. So the second largest hotel price ever paid in Nashville. It looks like the price of Broad West's recent Conrad Hotel was $170.5 million. Equals about $728,000 per room which is a little bit less. We had talked about the, the price setter um, that was $950,000 uh, per room earlier this year at the W Hotel, which was from March. Uh, but $730,000 in Nashville is nothing to uh, sneeze at. Uh, we also had a multifamily uh, green shoot. According to commercial observers, Greg Cornfield, they had a complex that sold for $82 million, where rents have increased 13.3% on average. Occupancy has been 97%. Um, Clear Capital was looking to get into the thriving multifamily market in Southern California's Inland Empire, uh, where soaring rents have been, um, you know, taking place since COVID-19. 
Looks like the firm acquired a 232-unit asset, Foothill Ridge, uh, in the city of Upland for 82 million. So that, that equates to about 353,000 per unit. So again, to everything Mana said earlier, each week we come on, we have more than a handful of, you know, record setting prices or really nice stories to tell, you know, and I, I was going to just quickly ask, you know, Martha or Manus, you know, part of me feels like on the office sector, on the, uh, the crabgrass, that we're just tracking those things a little bit more fervently than we were in the past. Like, I'm sure tenants were downsizing before COVID. I'm sure that people were moving from one location to another location at a corporate level. It just seems like maybe now we're paying a little bit more attention to that. I mean, obviously there's more of that, but I don't know how much more of that is actually taking place versus us just being a little bit more aware of it. Yeah, and we, I think that's, that's a great point. And I'll let Martha weigh in as well, but it's, you know, what we haven't seen yet is the combination of new normal and weakening earnings and perhaps uh, firms wanting to tighten their belts even more. And that may change the dynamic, but you're right, Lonnie, this, we've seen mortgage originators pull back before. We've seen firms uh, uproot from the upper Midwest to you know the Sun Belt uh, or Texas or from California to those areas and so forth. So, um, but yeah, I, I think your point is a good one. It's troubling to me when a company the size and scale of IBM, which in the U.S. has under 100,000 employees, but um, something like that decides that they don't have to have employees uh, come into the office as a, as a permanent state. So if only about 20% of their employee population is coming into the office a few days a week, when those leases expire, it is only natural that they decide to relook at what their footprint is. So companies that size and scale will definitely make a change uh, that will be impacted. Let's go to shout outs. We have a few of our friends, Dan Miggins, who listened to last week's pod. He said, you got to tell Manus, Sly and the Family Stone is everyday people. And Robert Palmer is every kind of people. So there you go. Yes, I was looking for every kind of people, which I love that song. It's a great number, but uh, I will never throw any shade towards Sly and the Family Stone, uh, one of the iconic artists of the 70s. And uh, it's a shame he didn't put out more stuff, uh, you know, during his peak. Thank you, Dan, for listening closely. And Jonathan Kay, he says he enjoys the show, listens every week without fail. And he's flying into Boston for a college friend's son's wedding, if you can keep all that together. And they're going to spend a couple days in Boston. And, you know, it was interesting. He asked us for a hotel recommendation. That's a first for us. I don't think we've ever been asked for kind of like an advice, advisor, trip advisor, Yelp kind of thing. It's a terrible idea to ask me because, you know, I, I use hotels like I use, you know, where I shop like clothing, right? I'm looking for the discountiest place. And if frills are your thing, you know, it's, it's not going to be something I, I kind of throw your way. It's just. Lonnie had a recommendation based on DSCR. Yeah, I just went through the data. I just let the data tell the story. I found the hotel is performing best. I said, listen, the market said this property is it. So uh, so we sent it over to him. So That's what happens yeah. when you ask TREP for a hotel recommendation. And Dan McNamara quoted our recent maturities report on Twitter. And Deborah, with rising interest rates, inflation, taxes, and insurance, be interesting to watch valuations as they're reported for the remainder of 2022, something we've talked about here and an old friend, Jan, sent us an email about our soggy cereal and other comments. We also had a number of quotes taken from our recent podcast in the Business Insider article. So, you know, it's that old someone quoting us to us kind of thing, uh, which is, is kind of interesting. And they, they talk a little bit about affordability rents that may be coming off their peaks, but I guess that remains to be seen. This year, as everybody's probably seen by now, having a cookout or even traveling to the cookout barbecue for July 4th is going to cost you more. So whether you're inviting people and hosting, it'd be about 17% more for that cookout. And if you're driving, filling up your gas tank, I don't know, maybe you just kind of stay home and watch a movie. Well, listen, there are things that I will skimp on and there are things that I won't. 
I will skimp on a hotel. I will skimp on my wardrobe, but there could be no skimping on the barbecue. You got to get, you know, great steaks and chops and, and chicken and everything else, right? That's, that's where I draw the line. Exactly. What's your address, Manis? <laughs> I'm kidding. With that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer, Haley Keen. Join us next week as we look at what happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or a comment, send your email to podcast at trep.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Happy long weekend. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right.